and she's back. Hello everyone, my name is Kim. I am a registered dietitian nutritionist, a certified diabetes care and education specialist, a certified nutrition support clinician, and the owner of KimRoseDietitian.com. Make sure you visit that website. I think it was last Friday, I realized that I hadn't made a case study video in a while. And seeing that the way that the world is just moving at this time and there's going to be a new sect of dietetic interns that are about to start their internship and also people that are sitting to take the RD exam, I figured now is the perfect time. So let us just jump right into things. So here's the scenario. So you are told that you have AT who is a 32 year old female and she has a history of type one diabetes. She presents with nausea and vomiting for three days, as well as elevated blood sugar levels and high levels of ketones are present in her urine. She is alert yet slightly confused at times and complains of excessive thirst. According to family members, AT has been unable to tolerate anything by mouth since she ran out of insulin three days prior. She was too busy to refill her prescription medications and subsequently ended up in the hospital. When blood work was done, it was discovered that AT's lab values are a bit off. Her BUN is 30. Her creatinine is 1.7, her phosphorus is 1.9, her blood sugar readings or blood glucose readings rather are 550 milligrams per deciliters, her potassium is 3.8, her magnesium is 2.6, and you calculate her osmolality and you find that her osmolality is 320. So what is going on? with AT. Well, to find out what's going on with AT, there's a few things that you need to take into consideration. You need to take into consideration her medical history, her history and physical, uh, as well as her lab values. So a few factors were very important in her history and physical. You were told that she has a history of type one diabetes. You're also told that she ran out of her insulin and did not have time to refill them. And based on her lab values, they're a little bit off kelter. So what is going on with AK is she is experiencing diabetic ketoacidosis. And that's quite evident because of the ketones which are present in her urine. The physician will probably have started her on a fluid resuscitation. And the fluid resuscitation is important to get the BUN and the creatinine down. If you guys thought that she had a kidney failure or acute kidney disease, dehydration can cause the BUN and creatinine to be elevated as well. So while the physician started her on fluid resuscitation, um, he or she will probably start her on an insulin drip, probably order some uh, potassium riders, phosphorus riders, as well as adjust that magnesium if needs be according to their protocol. This is not something that the dietitian needs to do, but the dietitian definitely needs to be aware of what is going on clinically with this patient and to make sure that these things are addressed. And the reason why the dietitian wants to check and just make sure that these things are addressed is to make sure that feedings are safe. So the good thing is that we are told that AT is alert yet slightly confused at times. So things will get a little more complicated if AT was unconscious or if she was comatose. Let's say hypothetically that you're consulted to see this patient. Is it safe? for the dietitian to start feedings orally, or is it not? Well, let's look at a few things. So in a perfect utopia, ideally speaking, you want to start feeding when DKA is resolved, but that does not mean that you cannot start feeding when DKA is not resolved. 
So here's how you start to orally feed the patient when DKA is not resolved. So they get their diet, they get their diet order, and what the nurse will do is to make sure that they have regular insulin or they have rapid, rapid acting insulin on board. Because if you remember, DKA is a condition where uh, the body is not utilizing glucose for energy because not enough insulin was on board. So that's why the insulin drip comes into play. So we just wanna make sure that there is enough insulin coverage going on because when the patient does start to eat, once they are alert and oriented, then we wanna make sure that we do not put them back into that DKA mode that they were in. And with this particular patient, you wanna make sure that the nausea and vomiting are resolved before feeding. And the reason for that is simple. You don't wanna feed someone and then make them throw up again. Uh, that is not something pleasant. So let's say um, that AT, she is still feeling nauseous and she can't eat anything. What to do in that situation? Because, you know, her body needs energy. Her body needs energy to function. So I know a lot of people will say, hmm, well, what about parental nutrition? Uh, no, that is not the case. So in this case, what you want to do, um, which will not be the role of a dietitian, but will be the role of the physician or the nurse practitioner or whatever provider that AT has, the provider will make sure that they are running um, some type of dextrose solution. Uh, the dextrose is definitely going to give them energy. And along with the dextrose solution, they're going to make sure that that insulin drip is going simultaneously to prevent even more elevated blood sugar levels. So let's just recap the three things. Number one, it's okay to feed in an ideal utopia um, when the DKA is resolved and the person can go back to eating normally, just making sure that before meals they take their regular insulin or their rapid acting insulin. That's the ideal. Scenario number two is DKA is not resolved but the patient has resolved nausea and vomiting. So you can, it's okay to feed, just wanna make sure that the regular and rapid acting insulin are on board as well. And number three, let's say that the nausea and vomiting are still there. So you wanna make sure that that insulin drip is there and maybe switch over the IV fluids into a dextrose. And additionally, it's important for the dietitian to monitor those labs. That BUN, the creatinine, the magnesium, the phosphorus, the potassium, calculating the osmolality. Let me see if I'm missing anything else. Um, and the blood sugar levels, of course. And the reason for that is because you wanna make sure that you keep an open line of communication with the provider um, so that feedings remain safe. So guys, this was it. This was uh, the next case study that we have for you today in really getting into the nitty gritty and knowing the patient and making sure that it is okay to feed them when they are going through DKA, which is a serious life-threatening condition. If you guys have any questions, please do not hesitate to leave it in my comment section below. Thank you for watching. Remember to share this video, like, and subscribe. Have a great day. Bye-bye.